Right. Okay. Um, so this is going to be pretty much the second to last lesson on this 3042 booklet. So we're hoping to go through the shapes of molecules again because it is quite a lot to learn. And then we're looking at the concept of electronegativity. We did that in periodic trends. So as a quick check, which area is the most, uh, which part of the periodic table has the most electronegative element? So is it top left, top right, bottom left, bottom right? Top right, good. We will see the periodic table is again and, and we'll check that, but well done. So you remember those lessons. Um, and then we're going to see how we can um, use things like bond dipoles and molecular dipoles to explain the polarity of molecules. And we should have time to do at least the introduction to intermolecular forces. So let's get going. Um, okay, so to work out the shape of the molecule as a revision for last lesson is remember you had to draw the Lewis structure. Now, to draw the Lewis structure, what is the first step you need to do to draw a Lewis structure? So if I say draw the Lewis structure for H2O, what do you need to do? I can see you have count the valence electrons. Correct. So that's really important. You add up all the valence electrons of each atom in that uh, formula. And once you've got that, you're well on the way to doing the, getting the right Lewis structure. Once you've got the Lewis structure, you have to count the total uh, number of regions of negative charge around that central atom. I didn't say around that central atom there on the uh, PowerPoint. But look for the central atom and count the number of uh, areas of the, uh, negative charge or electron density, same thing. And that will tell you the electron geometry. So if you've got two mm -hmm. regions around it, the central atom, it'll be linear, three regions, trigonal planar, four regions, tetrahedral, and so on. Okay, then we look at the number of bonding and non-bonding pairs to get the molecular shape. We will go through some examples again in case you're getting a bit lost. So let's do this one, BRF5. So the first step is you count the number of valence electrons. Bromine is in group seven, uh, 17. sorry. Fluorine is in group 17, so it's both in the same group. So I've got six atoms there in group 17, five fluorine and one bromine. So how many valence electrons have I got? So think of how many valence electrons do atoms in group 17 have? And I hope you know it's 7, so 7 times 6 is 42, correct. So I've got 42 electrons to distribute, so it would look like that. As I say, we explained how to do it last time, so I'm just doing a quick summary. And if you did your counting there, you would hopefully find 42. Remember, each line is 2 electrons. And as I say, I suggest you use lines for the bonding atoms simply because it reduces the number of dots you've got to draw and might get mixed up with. So if I've got now the first one, which is draw the Lewis um, structure, we now go into step two, which is the total number of areas of negative charge or regions of negative charge. So if you have a look, um, so I'm just going to quickly tap on here and get a color. So I hope you can see that's one region over there. That's another region. So it's two, three, four, five, six over there. That's the sixth one over there. I hope that makes sense. So if I've got six regions of negative charge, what is my basic structure? What is my electron geometry? Can people remember? OK, nobody's typing, so I'll just um, move on. It's the octahedral. So if I just typed in the uh, top over here, remember if it's 2, it's linear. Oops, that 
L didn't come out very well. So linear, I'm doing it to the pin to Oh, I'm not writing very well. Three is trigonal planar. Oh, I'm not going to try this. I'm not doing very good at all with this. <laughs> yes, to say it, I quite agree. Trigonal planar. Three is tetrahedral. Sorry, three is trigonal planar. Four is tetrahedral. Five is um, trigonal bipyramidal and six is octahedral. Now, Andrew, with a T-shaped, those that's not one of the basic shapes. That's the ones when you start counting the lone P's, which is step number three. When you now say, okay, that's my basic shape, octahedral, but now how many pairs of bonding electrons and pairs of non-bonding electrons do I have? And I think you can see from that BRF3 Lewis, uh, BRF5 Lewis structure, I've got one non-bonding pair and five bonding pairs. So if you think of that shape, it would look like that. And do you know the name of that shape? It's not T-shaped because I've got too many bonding pairs. Does anybody remember what that shape is? Okay, Andrew is typing. Okay, the, um, it's not quite by the um, bipyramidal is when it's got f five bonding pairs with no non-bonding pairs. So this is actually the square pyramidal. And we'll go over some more shapes now. I see Jonathan is typing, but let's just quickly go on to some revision of shapes. So if you look over there, um, the first two, because some of the shapes have got the same names, so the first two are both linear. So CO2, it's got two regions of electron density. They are both bonding pairs, no non-bonding. So it's just straight linear for both the electron geometry, which is written in blue, and the bold is the molecular shape. So the next one is also linear. Um, We've still got three atoms, but now we have three non-bonding pairs of electrons. So we've got five areas of electron density, and therefore the electron geometry is trigonal by pyramidal, but um, the shape is linear because three of those are non-bonding. And in both those cases, the bond angle would be what? 180 degrees. Okay, so for the um, xenon uh, bifluor or difluoride, it doesn't really, the lone pairs don't affect the angle at all. Right, then we've got the two at the bottom are both bent, so you can see the, the shape is highlighted in bold, but can you see that the blue, which shows the electron geometry, is different? So for SO2, it's trigonal planar because we've got three regions of electron density. And in water, we've got four regions of electron density. So that's tetrahedral. So what would the bond angle be in SO2, where we've got only three regions of electron density? 120, correct. And in water, it would be what? One oh five. Okay, if you said one oh nine, that's still acceptable. The one oh five, it, it gets slightly smaller because of the lone pairs doing a little bit more repulsion. But yes, one oh five would be correct, or one oh nine also accepted. Um, so it's really important to look at the number of regions of negative charge and use those to determine the bond angle. Um, don't just think, oh, it's bent, so it must be, and then just guess a figure. You have to count the number of regions of negative charge. Then the other two are just some ones we didn't look at last time, so I thought I'd bring them up again. And that is the seesaw. I don't know if you can imagine, you know, one person sitting up here on the left. Uh, so it's person sitting over there and the other person sitting over there. And this is the base of it, and they can swing up and down. <laughs> um, so it's a seesaw shape, but it's based on the trigonal bipyramidal shape. Now, the trigonal bipyramidal shape 
has actually got um, two different bond angles. Do you know what they are? Okay, nobody is typing, so let me just quickly get a, another color, and I'll just use red. Okay, the bond angles generally for the um, ones between the axial plane, oh, I didn't show it in another color of which I wanted. Right, so that, remember, is the axial plane. Right, so the bond angle there generally is... Sorry, I'm not very good at this yet. So that should be a right angle because the equatorial plane, which I'll do in another color, the equatorial plane involves this bit over here. This is at 90 degrees to the, the red line. doesn't really look like it, but I hope you can sort of see that. So that's a 90 degree angle. But if you look at the equatorial plane, there are only three things in it. So this bond angle here between these two atoms would be 120. I need to keep on r r keeping this totally upright, which I haven't got used to, instead of at a slant. So that's 120 degrees. So you've got 90 degrees and 120. Um, so because this is based on the trigonal bipyramidal, it'll have the same sort of idea. It'll be approximately 90 and approximately 120. Just like water, that lone pair does do a bit of distortion, so it'll be slightly less than 90 and slightly less than 120. But that's the main um, idea. And then we have, for the last one, that is your T-shaped you were talking about earlier. And because in the equatorial plane, both two of them are already um, the lone pairs over there. All we've got here is this bond angle, which is 90. So it's a bond angle between the equatorial plane and the axial plane is 90 degrees. So look at the electron geometry to get the bond angles. And then you look at the number of bonding pairs and non-bonding pairs to get the molecular shape. Any questions? Right, so Andrew is typing. Okay, what's axial plane? Okay, the axial plane is, um, it's only important in the trigonal bipyramidal basic shape because it actually doesn't matter in the octahedral, which is the other one that has it. The axial plane is always the straight one that goes across um, so it like rotates around the axial uh, sort of 180 degrees from each other. The equatorial plane, I should have perhaps changed it to a different color. Um, but the equatorial plane is when you've always got sort of the, for the trigonal bipyramidal, there'll always be three things in it. That'll be the equatorial plane. And the equatorial plane is always at 90 degrees to the axial plane. So... To get the axial plane, it's got to be always three atoms in a row, uh, in a straight line, and the equatorial plane is the other one. Does that help, Andrew? Okay. So, depending on how the molecule is orientated, it doesn't have to be vertical. It can be horizontal. It's just the way it's going. Uh, it's just the way it's going. Okay, we'll see some more examples here. So, here we've got... Uh, the ones on the left based on the octahedral shape. So going by the axial plane, um, really it's this ones where we had three things in a uh, row. Now we're just missing the two end bits. So that's really the axial plane. And then the equatorial plane is this bit. I know you can't see it at the moment until I stop writing that bit over there. That's the equatorial plane. Uh, but in the octahedral basic shape, they're all at 90 degrees, so it's actually not important. You could have made any one of these, if I change the color again to say orange, um, I could have made this across here.
the axial plane. Okay, I'll just draw it again. So that bit over there could be the axial plane and the other parts the equatorial. It's, um, it doesn't matter which three atoms in a row you choose for octahedral. Okay, over here, again, for this bottom one, we could make that the axial plane and the others the equatorial. But again, it's not particularly an issue. So if we had a look at the names, um, the first one, and why I put these four together, it's because there's an overlap of words. We have square planar shape for that one based on the octahedral electron geometry. And we have the trigonal planar. So there's that word planar that comes up in both those shapes. That means they're just simply flat. They're not three-dimensional. So both the square planar and the trigonal planar are flat shapes. Um, compare it with the trigonal pyramidal for ammonia. So there's a repeat of the word trigonal. But whereas a trigonal planar is flat, it's only got three areas of electron density um, and no uh, non-bonding pairs. The trigonal pyramidal is based on the tetrahedral electron geometry, and there's one lone pair. And then finally, the other one is a repeat of the word square and pyramidal. So square pyramidal, that's also based on the octahedral. So those can be confusing. And the best way I can say is, is just to practice drawing them out. Um, have unless you want to come up with a mnemonic about it. But for me, it's best drawing it out and then trying to work out the name. Or make flashcards. There are flashcards available on the Ottle site, and you can just test yourself with the different shapes. So do you think you can write Lewis structures and you can work out the electron geometry by counting the regions of a negative charge? Good. And can you then work out the molecular shape, once you've learned all the names of the shapes, counting the number of regions of bonding and non-bonding pairs of electrons? So, so you have to learn the names of the shapes. You'll have to use the flashcards, yes. Because if you don't know the names of the shapes, relating to the number of lone pairs and so on, you're going to get them wrong. So you have to learn that off by heart. OK. So you need all that background information in order to work out the polarity of a molecule. Now, polarity, if you think of poles, you can think of the North Pole and the South Pole of the Earth. That's where the word pole comes from. And that's because of the magnet in the Earth caused by the iron core uh, in the Earth. So here we've got our magnet. Um, right, so we have sort of that north end attracting another south end. In a molecule, we can have the same sort of thing of poles, but instead of being magnets, a magnetic pole, a north pole and a south pole, we have an area that's a bit negative. Um, I don't know if you can see that. And the other bit, which is slightly positive. So we've got a negative end, if you like, or slightly negative end, and a slightly positive end. And that's like electrostatic poles. So the slightly negative end of a molecule, what would it attract from another molecule? So say I had two HF molecules. So I say I had an HF. It's just not writing very well. And I have another HF right. The negative end is going to attract the positive end of the other HF. And that doesn't make much sense there. But if this was a negative end and this the positive end. OK, the negative end will, or the slightly negative end, will attract the positive end. OK, so that's where the word pole comes from. Now, the next question is, well, why study polarity? OK. Um, oh, OK, that's actually going to be the next slide, actually. But to study, to work out the polarity, obviously what is being attracted is going to involve energy. 
because there's going to be attraction and energy involved. And that's going to affect things like your boiling point, your melting point, and so on. And that's why we study polarity. So to work out the polarity, again, you draw the Lewis structure. You work out the electron geometry by using the total number of regions of negative charge or electron density. Then we work out the molecular shape. So you can remember this is LEM, L-E-M, if you like a sequence. And remember, you work out the molecular shape counting your bonding and non-bonding pairs and just having learned all those shapes off by heart. And then the next bit is you have to look at electronegativity of each of the bonding atoms, bond dipoles, I'll explain what those are uh, just now, and then we look at the symmetry of the molecule. So those are the two extra steps. The first three you did to work out molecular shape, now you add two extra steps to work out the polarity. And I think the best way to do this is to work out, um, you know, with some examples. So before we go into the examples, first of all, remember your periodic trends. And I know you know that because I asked you that at the beginning of the lesson. Electronegativity, remember, increases across a period. Fluorine is the most electronegative element. And um, remember... If I had that HF, then the fluorine would be the more negative, so it would have the more negative end. Hydrogen, being on the other side of the periodic table, would be more positive, so they'll be the positive end. So you are given a periodic table, so you can use that in the exam to work out relatively. You don't have to know the actual values, just relative. So if I asked you, what is more electronegative? Fluorine or chlorine, which one would it be? Fluorine, because electronegativity increases up the um, group. And remember, Cl is down there. Or if I said um, silicon and phosphorus, which one would be more electronegative? So silicon is over there. I've got a, uh, uh, yeah, no, that's correct, sorry. Uh, no, hang on. Um, phosphorus. Hang on. I've gone blank. Phosphorus is over here. Sorry, I went blank all of a sudden. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. And so uh, the phosphorus would be because the electronegativity increases across the period. Okay. Good. So use that per periodic table. And one more point before we go on to um, our fit is um, the, I was talking about bond dipoles. If you have a difference in electronegativity between the bonding atoms, there's an unequal sharing of electrons. Because remember, what is electronegativity? It's the attraction to the bonding electrons. So if I've got, for instance, down over here, um, oxygen and fluorine being bonded together, which one uh, of oxygen or fluorine will more strongly attract those bonding electrons? Fluorine. And so those shared electrons are closer to the fluorine and um, it's an unequal sharing. So we haven't got a pure covalent bond anymore. There's now what we call a slight shift in electron density. One end is slightly negative and the other end is slightly positive. Yep, the fluorine will be more negative. So we say there's now a, a dipole, a bond dipole, or the, the bond is polar covalent. Uh, if I had fluorine bonded to fluorine, is there any difference in electronegativity? No. So that would be what we call a non-polar covalent bond, or pure covalent, correct. So there's no difference uh, there, and there's, so there's going to be no bond dipole 
everything will be equally shared, the electrons will be equally distributed. And mm. we can work all the way up and slowly it becomes more and more polar until we get to say cesium fluoride up here where mm. it's such a big difference between the um, attraction to those bonding electrons that we consider to be ionic where fluorine has just grabbed those electrons completely as far as we're concerned and cesium hardly ever sees them so we consider them to be an ionic bond. Right, so what we're going to look at now is this FET and it should work a lot better than hopefully last time. So I'm just quickly going to uh, maximize and share my screen. Right, so hopefully you can see what's happening here. Um, I'm going to just first look at two atoms. Notice this one over here, it's got very little electronegativity. It's quite low, whereas the other one's quite high. And because it's more electronegative, there's going to be a shift in electron density towards B. And that's what this black arrow is. It's um, more positive around A, and it's more negative around B. So if I drew an electrostatic potential, can you see the red end is negative, and the blue end is positive. So I can change this. I can look, look at the bond character. So at the moment, it's sort of halfway between pure covalent and ionic. If I made this less electronegative, I'd get a pure covalent bond. You can see the colors disappeared. It's white because it's totally neutral, uh, even uh, sharing. Whereas if I go all the way across, it becomes really ionic. So I've got basically an anion on this side, an anion, and a cation on the other side. So that's what this is going to show. Um, if I looked at the partial charges, can you see we use it word delta negative and delta positive? If it's ionic, we can use a full negative and a full positive, but it's just to show there's been that shift in electron density. If I do the same thing with three atoms, what we've got here is like an example of water, where an oxygen is quite electronegative, um, being represented with B, and um, A and C are not as electronegative. Uh, if I drew the... Um, Actually, it doesn't show the, the field here. It just shows the partial charges. So B will be negative. Now, that what's in yellow is the bond, sorry, is the molecular dipole, the overall um, spread of electrons. So this side near B is more negative, whereas this side is more positive down there. If I showed the bond dipoles, can you see there's a pull of electron density towards B from that side? and towards that side. If you do physics and you've done vectors, bond dipoles work on vectors. So um, that's where it comes from. Now at the moment I can't see any chat, um, so I will look at any questions if you've got any just when I've just finished this section. Right, so I could again change this and by changing it can you see how the bond dipole changes? because this is becoming much more electronegative. My electron density is shifting towards this side of the molecule. Uh, again, if I made that very negative, this is pulling down, that is pulling down, so this is the negative end of my molecule, and that's my positive end. So this is an OTL, this link. Play around. It's really good to see uh, how those bond dipoles change with the molecular dipole because you have to add up the bond dipoles to get an overall molecular dipole. So if I make this one not very much, so this is the same as B, uh, B and C are the same, so there's not much pull there. All there is is a shift in electron density this way. So both my bond dipole and my molecular dipole are the same. This, because there's no bond dipole, doesn't affect the um, 
the overall molecular dipole, these would be the same. Or if I made this go down, I've now got something shifting across. So if you added up this one and that one in black, those two bond dipoles, you'd get a shift in electron density. So this would be the negative end of the molecule, and this would be the positive end of the molecule. So let's go on to real molecules. So what I'm going to show is the bond dipoles. Can you see that in gray? Because fluorine is the more electronegative element, and hydrogen is the less one. And because I've only got two atoms in this molecule, my molecular dipole will be exactly the same as my bond dipole. Because I've only got one bond dipole there, so one plus zero is one. So they'll be identical. And I can show my partial charges. OK, it gives you exact numbers. We won't worry with that. Um, now, you can see the electron neg uh, electronegativities here. You do not have to learn these off by heart at all. Um, you're not expected to know them. All you're expected to know is that nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon, and oxygen is more electronegative than nitrogen. That's based on your periodic trends. So that's something you do need to remember. Um, hydrogen, and I can't really ask you a question because I can't see your answer. Hydrogen is more electronegative than boron. And hopefully you can work out why. It's because hydrogen is higher up in the periodic table. So remember that it goes decreases in electronegativity as you go down. And that's why hydrogen, although it's on the left of boron, it's slightly higher up. So it'll have a slightly higher elect um, electronegativity. So if I draw my potential uh, um, net, then we've got our negative end over here and our positive end over there. So let's quickly go through these. Nitrogen, is there a difference in electronegativity? As I say, I can't see your answers. Um, but can you see it's two nitrogen atoms equal sharing, no bond dipole. So there's going to be no molecular dipole. And if I go into oxygen, exactly the same. If I go into fluorine, exactly the same. No bond dipole, so no molecular dipole. We've done HF. We've just got the two um, atoms, so the bond dipole will be the same as the molecular dipole. But now let's go on to water. Because remember there were those that two extra steps to work out the polarity. The first one was to check your electronegativity. And the second one was to look at the shape and symmetry of the molecule. So can you see oxygen more electronegative, hydrogen less? So there's a bond dipole going towards the oxygen. And the same thing from the other hydrogen. Now, this molecule is not symmetrical. So the bond dipoles don't cancel. They add up to form an extra big molecular dipole. So we're going to have a polar water molecule. Um, compare this to CO2, where it's the opposite. I have a bond dipole between carbon and oxygen. I have another bond dipole between this carbon and oxygen. But because the molecule is symmetrical, I can cut this in any way I like. I can cut it over here, and this side is identical to that side. I can cut it across over here, and this top bit is the same as the bottom bit. So um, that's all totally symmetrical, the molecule. So it's going to be a um, symmetrical molecule, and the bond dipoles are going to cancel out. So if I say 1, subtract 1, it's going to be 0, because they equal the bond dipoles. And I have so my molecule will be nonpolar. OK. Can you see I still have a slightly different charge distribution? This one is slightly uh, negative, and that's slightly negative with positive in the middle. But the electron density, we, um, it's overall nonpolar because it's symmetrically arranged around the central atom. So um, the easiest way when you explain this is just simply to say the molecule is, non, uh, is symmetrical. 
and uh, because it's bonded to the same outer atoms that are uh, opposite each other, so the bond dipoles cancel, leaving me with a non-polar molecule. Um, I know a lot of students try and talk about the shift in electron density, but you can get yourself muddled a bit with that. And if I carry on, HCN, nitrogen is the most electronegative, carbon less so, and hydrogen even less so. So there is a bond dipole going from hydrogen to carbon, and another bond dipole going from carbon to nitrogen. So there's a shift in electron density. And so this will be the negative end, and that'll be the positive end of the molecule, or the slightly negative and the slightly positive end. And um, we'll look at ozone in, in later, actually. Let's look at ammonia. Again, we've got here, and I can move, this is great in that you can shift, shift it around. So can you see I've got a bond dipole from this H to the nitrogen, a bond dipole from the second H to the nitrogen, and if I looked over there, I've got another bond dipole. So again, you'd say there's a difference in electronegativity. Hydrogen is less electronegative than nitrogen. So there'd be a bond dipole in each NH bond. And because the molecule is not symmetrical, you can see it's not symmetrical. I'll try and get it back to how it was. Well, let me just do it like that. If I cut it down here, it does look as though the left half is the same as the right half. But if I cut it across, then you can see that this top half is not the same as the bottom half. So it's not a symmetrical molecule um, because actually of its lone pair, it makes it not symmetrical. And so the bond dipoles do not cancel, and I have a molecular dipole. Now, I won't do any more. You can do as many as you like uh, when you look at it yourself. Um, so I'm just going to go to restore. So you just play around with that. And it's quite good to pull those molecules around and just to see um, the molecule from all angles and where the bond dipoles are. Has anybody used that FET simulation? No. OK. But as I say, it's, it's a good one to play around with. The FET ones are actually really good. Yeah. OK, so that's that FET. It really gives you a good idea of how changing the electronegativity changes your bond dipoles and the shape of the molecule whether it's symmetrical or asymmetrical, is going to affect the molecular dipole. So let's go step by step through things. The first one we're going to look at is O2. Remember, we looked at it in FET. So let's have a quick look again. First step, draw the Lewis structure. Now, in the exams, they normally give you the Lewis structure if you have to compare polarity. It's just because if you go wrong with the Lewis structure, you're going to be wrong throughout. So they tend to always give you the Lewis structure. But you have to work out the electron geometry and the molecular shape as well, which I hope you realize is linear as well. Then you have to discuss electronegativity. As I say, you have to discuss these points if you want excellence. Um, so oxygen, is there any change in electronegativity from one oxygen to the other? Nope. So there's both atoms have the same electronegativity, so there's no difference. So there's going to be no bond dipoles. Now, I got this, um, these diagrams from um, this one over here. So you can actually pretty much look at any molecule, just type it in with that program, and it'll show you all the shapes. You can put in the bond dipoles and, and so on. It also shows you the overall polarity of the molecule. Can you see that it says the naught Debye? That's the, um, Debye is the unit, actually, of bond dipole. They're actually called dipole moments, and the unit is Debye. But you can just talk about bond dipoles and molecular dipole. Then you have to look at symmetry, and you can see that that's a symmetrical molecule, and so there's no molecular dipole, and so O2 is nonpolar. And as I say, that'll affect its uh, boiling point, melting point, solubility, and so on. HCN. So let's have a go. Lewis structure. 
and I hope you'd be able to work that. Remember the way you'd work with HCN, you'd look at hydrogen contributes one valence electron, carbon contributes four, nitrogen contributes five, so you've got ten electrons um, to distribute. Okay, and you write, uh, Andrew, electron geometry is linear, molecular shape is linear because there aren't any lone pairs. Electronegativity, now you have to spell it out. Nitrogen is more electronegative than carbon, carbon is more electronegative than hydrogen, so there will be bond dipoles. Now, I don't show the bond dipoles here because it made the um, diagram quite itty bitty, so it's only showing that yellow molecular dipole. Um, is that molecule symmetrical or asymmetrical? Asymmetrical. Now, I remember my chemistry professor all those years ago saying only S's spell asymmetrical with a double S. Asymmetrical only has one S in it, but it has two M's. So well done, Jonathan. You didn't put in two S's. <laughs> and molecular dipole, you'd have to then argue, because it's an asymmetrical molecule, the bond dipoles do not cancel. So you've got a molecular uh, dipole, and so the molecule is polar. If any molecule has a molecular dipole, it must be polar. Okay, do you notice how I'm stressing molecular dipole, bond dipole? I find students tend to often be very um, slack with words when they're trying to write a lot. And so they might say, bonds cancel, or uh, dipoles, um, you, and they aren't very clear whether they're talking about a bond or molecular dipole. So make sure you don't say bonds cancel. The molecule would fall apart if there weren't any bonds. Uh, it's only the bond dipoles that cancel. Okay. So if I looked at this one, again, hydrogen contributes one each, so it's two plus four from carbon uh, plus six from oxygen in terms of valence electrons. So you should be able to draw the Lewis structure. The electron geometry, um, because time is getting on, I know, Jonathan, okay, as you can see, your typing is trigonal planar. Molecular shape is uh, also trigonal planar because we don't have any lone pairs. Electronegativity. Again, you've got your periodic table. Oxygen is on the right, so it's more electronegative than carbon, which is more electronegative than hydrogen. So there will be bond dipoles, and there they are. And is that molecule symmetrical or asymmetrical? Just write S or A if you like. It's asymmetrical, correct. And so the bond dipoles don't cancel. And so you've got a molecular dipole, so the molecule is polar. Now I've got BRF5. That's the one we looked at earlier at the beginning of the lesson. So there's the Lewis structure. Remember the there are eight areas of sorry, six areas of electron density. So it's the electron geometry of octahedral. And the molecular shape, if you had a look, was square uh, um, pyramidal. Now the electronegativity, is there a difference in electronegativity between F and BR? Yes, with F being the more electronegative one, so we've got that difference in electronegativity, so there will be bond dipoles um, in the BRF bond, and it's asymmetric, as I think you can see, and so the same sort of thing, bond dipoles do not cancel. Can you see, once you've learned the pattern, it's actually very easy to answer these questions. It um, all follows the same pattern. Tricky one, ozone. Okay, ozone, if you worked it out, 3 times 6 is 18 for valence electrons, and I think I should have 18 there, 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, yep, so that's correct. The electron geometry, now the electron geometry, you look at the total number of areas of negative charge. How many areas of negative charge have I got around the central oxygen? Three, correct. So the electron geometry will be trigonal planar, but because one of them is a lone pair, it's like SO2, it'll be bent, 
with a bond angle of 120 degrees. Now this is a, it's quite a tricky bit because oxygen has got the same electronegativity. So you wouldn't expect any bond dipoles. You would expect an equal sharing of the bonding electrons. And that's correct. Okay. However, when I say different sharing of electrons, what I meant was a total number of electrons. Um, the central atom has got a lone pair on it. Now, there's a part of chemistry we do not teach at level three called resonance, which would make this explanation a lot easier, because um, basically the two outer atoms are equal. They do a funny sharing of electrons. Um, but the central atom has got a lone pair, so it's got an electron-rich site over there. So the molecule is not symmetrical. Can you see? There's, it's not a big dipole. It's very small. It's only 0.6. But ozone is slightly polar because of this lone pair sitting on the um, central oxygen. And that makes... Because it's an asymmetrical molecule, it makes the molecule uh, polar. So although there's not so much the bond dipole um, and the sharing of electrons, but because the oxygen in the middle is more negative, we do have bond dipoles. And so we do also have molecular, di uh, molecular dipole because the molecule is asymmetric. That's the hardest one because you would expect it to be nonpolar, but it's because of that asymmetric distribution of electrons. Right. So, very briefly, improve on these statements. The ammonium ion is nonpolar as the bonds cancel. Now, there is a glaring error there, and it's not the first bit. The ammonium ion is actually nonpolar. That is actually correct. But what is okay so you've got the bonds cancelling bonds never cancel you've got to say the bond dipoles cancel so what you also have to say is um, you know this is bonds can't cancel you've got to say bond dipoles you didn't discuss electronegativity or the person that answered this you didn't discuss shape or the symmetry of molecules. So you wouldn't actually get anything for this. Okay. The no. next one, you no. haven't really, you've said that the shape is symmetrical, so you could get perhaps achieved for that, but you wouldn't get more than that because you didn't discuss electronegativity difference and you didn't mention bond dipoles. You just simply said that the shape was symmetrical. So you'd give one of the three points, but not all three. For the no. next one, Okay, you just said there were no di dipoles. This wouldn't get an, uh, achieved because you were too vague. You were correct that PCL6 is nonpolar, but you were too vague. So you have to talk about electronegativity difference or mention the electronegativities of each bonding atom. You've got to talk about bond dipoles, symmetry of the molecule, and the molecular dipole. And the last one is exactly the same. You said the dipoles don't cancel. You weren't really referring to which ones. So you have to have that detail. OK. Um, we've got a few minutes left. Do you want to stop there? And we'll do intermolecular forces next week. Um, or should I go on to intermolecular forces? OK. All right, so we'll go until 2.30. Intermolecular forces are the forces between molecules. Now, you'll see this word intramolecular and intermolecular. And the easiest way to, me, if, to remember is, like, if you've got the intranet, like land, par uh, land parties or so on, or the internet. So intranet, internet is like intramolecular and intermolecular. So intramolecular is the bonds within the molecule, and if intermolecular is bonds between the molecules. So does that picture make it a bit clearer when you're referring to those two terms? And so if we try to show here, intramolecular is the bonding 
in the molecule, and inter is the bonding between the molecules. I like to be clear, I tend to always use the word bonding really for covalent bonds or ionic bonds, or perhaps hydrogen bonds because it's in the name. And then I try to say forces of attraction to try and, uh, yes, I told it 2.30. So it's not quite 2.30 yet. I said I had a, um, a lesson until 2.30. Yeah. Oh, okay. Just say I'll be there at 2.30. Yeah. So uh, can you see I've used, sorry about that, the force of attraction, just to try and make it clear it's not a bond, because often students tend to use the word bond and they're not, it's not clear what they're referring to. And so carrying on, the intermolecular forces are weak forces of attraction. And what I've tried to show here is, here's my molecule over here, quite far away from the other one. So there's not much attraction. So you can see my two atoms on the right-hand side, the two neon atoms. As they get closer, uh, so here they get closer, can you see they're dropping in potential energy? Energy is being released. So as they're getting closer, they're getting less energy because they're giving out energy. And you might, if you look really carefully, see some yellow arrows in the middle of each one showing a slight attraction. And as they get closer still, there's an attraction there. And you get to a point where the attraction between the nucleus of one and the electrons of the other uh, is equalized by the repulsion between the electrons and the electrons, or the two nuclei. And if I try to push them closer still, then there's lots of repulsion. So the purple is the big repulsion. So what I'm trying to show you is the energy, whether it's a bond or a force of attraction, there's always energy involved. But with forces of attraction, intermolecular ones, it tends to be only a little bit of energy. It's not major amounts like in covalent bonds. Any questions so far? No. OK. So basically, here we're just looking at what are inter and intra and so on. So I hope the first one you can see are covalent bonds are intramolecular. Andrew, I know you're typing the answer, but because we're getting short of time. Uh, so the intramolecular force of attraction or intramolecular bonds. Intermolecular force of attractions are found between molecules. And then, of course, intermolecular forces of attraction are weaker than covalent bonds, or they involve less energy than covalent bonds. And finally, which ones of those can form intermolecular attractions? The first one is ionic, so it wouldn't. The second one is a molecule, so it would. And then argon, it's like a it's a molecule even though it's just an element by itself. So it doesn't have to be combined with something else. And water is um, also a molecule. Magnesium oxide is ionic, so it won't. So, oh, and some other shifted across. It should have been O2, argon, and water. So that changed, actually. And as I say, why are intermolecular forces important? It's because once you've worked out the polarity, you can work out the intermolecular forces, and that'll determine, because of the energy involved, the melting point, the boiling point, the solubility, because they all involve energy. Then there are other properties which you don't have to do at level three, but like viscosity and surface tension. OK, so the sort of thing you would answer would be like the stronger the intermolecular forces, the higher the boiling point, because more energy is needed to break those intermolecular forces to separate the molecules. So it's all those steps, and we'll look at those in more detail. And then solubility is we're also looking at energy being released when we're breaking and making intermolecular forces. I think I'm going to stop there, and we'll look at the types of intermolecular forces next week. And we'll look at the types of questions you can answer uh, in the exams and so on. So next week's lesson will be on intermolecular forces and perhaps if there's time, thermochemistry. Right. You have a good rest of the week and weekend. And I hope this has all been helping. Right. Bye.